So hello, it's the middle of September 2021 and what you're looking at is quite an exciting screen. It is a testing screen in support of my sale of a Seagate ST251-1 hard drive. <clears throat> now this has got a hard drive with 820 cylinders and six surfaces and what you're looking at is the uh, the read-all program of a Kromenko uh, Z2 68000 system reading the entire surface of the hard drive. Uh, I hit enter a few times just because I was a bit bored and that's the reason why I haven't started the video from scratch because you would have got very bored. So we're up to cylinder 753, 754. If I hit enter you'll see that uh, it's just an ASCII program running and you, you kind of, you know, okay. So we're going to get up to 820 and as you can see there are absolutely no errors at all so far which is extraordinary since this drive there is a date of 1990 on it, but it, even if it is 1990, that's still um, a 30 plus year old hard drive. Okay, we're just finishing. Right, so as you can see, the drive has passed with zero errors. Uh, and again, this is a 30 plus old drive. So what I normally do in these circumstances is I, I start the system from scratch and test the system in the monitor. But for now, you're going to have to bear with me. I'm going to do it in, in the reverse order. What I've done first of all above is I've tested the drive. It's tested 100% clean. I do know that this drive hasn't got an alternate track table. So with the Kremenko series of computers, uh, you can use the read all program to check the drive. And then you can remap any um, bad surface or cylinder to a an area they call the uh, alternate track table. So if I do a disk info of STD31, you'll see that when I created this drive in 2009, it didn't have any errors then, so I didn't give it an alternate track table, which is very, very naughty because a drive could at any point in the future develop an, uh, a, a fault. And so what you would normally do is always give it an alternate track table. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna take this drive and we're gonna re-format uh, or re-jig the partition table to give it a slightly smaller size uh, and an alternate track table. So let's do that. So remember it's got uh, 820 cylinders. So that's between naught and 819, writing this down. So let's say between naught and uh, eight, one four so that's 815 cylinders if you like is the data portion and 815 to 819 inclusive is going to be the alternate track table so we're going to do it in it hard command Device name is STD31. It knows it's read the partition table, which is stored on track zero. So these are early early days, and there was no way for the controller to talk to the hard drive to say, "What size are you?" So that's actually written. And when I've I've previously run the init hard minus n command, and I've written that to the hard drive. So anyway, so I'm just going to hit. It. I won't change these values. So it's six surfaces, 820 cylinders, maximum number of alternate tracks. Must be the multiple of the number of surfaces. So there's six surfaces. And I just said 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So I said five surfaces. So I said maximum number of tracks. So I'm going to say 30. That's six. Uh, times six surfaces times five tracks. Okay, okay. Right, so starting cylinder is of this disk is going to be one. So we're not going to use the cylinder zero for any of our data. Uh, right pre compensation is not required on this disk. Do I want to initialize any tracks? We'll say no to that and it knows therefore because I chose 30 
that, the, that I can have a single partition starting uh, uh, of, of size 814 cylinders. So I want to change partition table. Uh, has it actually changed the partition? Yeah, so that's the partition. So the partition, the first partition is between cylinder 1 and 814. Alternate track location should be at, according to me, 814. Do you want to add an alternate track? No, I don't. So now if we do a disk info STD31, what does that show me? Okay, so we've got six heads, 820 cylinders. We've got 30 alternate tracks. Location of alternate tracks is 815, and we've got starting cylinder between 1 and 814 is where the data is going to be kept. So the size of the data, because Kromenko uses track formatting effectively, there are 814 cylinders, and that's going to give us 48840. So coming close to 50 megabytes, which is a pretty decent size in 1980-something. So, that first partition would be seen as STD0. So if I want to write a Kremenko uh, file system on there, I need to make a file system onto there. So I need to do a MAKFS of STD0. Let's show you first, ls minus l of slash dev slash STD star. So in the device directory of this operating system booted from the floppy you see we've I've, I've generated four entries SCD 31 first the entire drive SCT 0 1 and 2 would be the first three partitions so if I say MAKFS of STD 0 we will uh, can I, is it a verbose command, M-A-K-F-S minus H, I don't think there is, let's just see if it's got some, no, you can set the number of inos, but I'm not going to do that, so M-A-K-F-S of STD0, okay, here we go. So it knows there was an existing file system on there because uh, I previously had a, an entire Chrome ex installation on there and that's being wiped right now. So we're trying to listen to the disk now. So what MAKFS is doing is making a file system and it, it's writing um, a file system structure onto that hard drive. So it, that involves writing certain uh, blocks in certain places throughout the whole of the hard drive, not just at the beginning. So that's why it'll do a lot of seeking. You can't quite hear that, I'm sure. Now hopefully this process won't take that long because uh, <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I was trying to keep this video short. But this is, these larger drives do take longer to format, longer to partition, longer to make a file system on. So, you know, you're going to have to bear with me. Now we can see, by the way, just I'm going to write this down so we can see in the, for the future that the, um, the major node is 6 and the minor node is zero, and that's what STD zero is known as. So when we, when we boot the system from a floppy, uh, depending how we configure the boot program, it can either automatically boot an operating system in a certain place, or it can ask you where do you want to boot it. And hopefully I'll get the chance to say boot to six 
colon zero. So I've written that down. So when we've done the entire operating system copying, we can then boot the system. I'm hoping the driver's making noises. I'm guessing if you're watching this video, you can just uh, press the right hand on the on a YouTube video. You can press the right hand arrow, and it'll jump forward about 10 seconds. So you can practice doing that to save me listening to my voice droning on. So the game plan after this, after we've made the file system, we're then going to mount the file system onto a directory of the floppy. And then we're going to use the cptree command to copy all the files from the floppy onto the hard drive. That shouldn't take that long. There's only one megabyte of files. And then we're going to write a boot block onto the hard drive so that it can boot. Now... All this will all will become clear when I'm actually doing the commands. So, um, don't forget, in the early days of these Unix or Unix-like systems, there was no fancy compressed file system, which was then expanded. You literally just had a small boot program, a bootstrap program, which would get you to the actual operating system, in this case. You didn't store a compressed copy of the operating system somewhere else that you would then on the fly read and uncompress and then load to start your computer. You actually had a boot block which led to a larger program which in this case loads the actual operating system from the file from the file system itself, if you like the root file system. There we go. Okay, so we have a work a made file system completely cleaned out if I do a free of std0 the seeking on this drive is extremely quiet it's actually less than the rotational noise of the motor So it's just checking the free list and checking what what blocks are free and what blocks are occupied. In fact, nothing is occupied. So we should be the free space on this drive should be pretty much up to that forty-eight thousand mark. Here. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. All that free space. I mean. This is an immense amount of space for a system in 1980-something. I mean, we'd be, we'd, we're basically drowning in space. Right, so ls-l minus of the root file system, which is on the floppy, shows me all these files. And we've created a dummy mount point uh, to mount things onto. So I'm going to say mount the device std0 onto slash da then I'm going to say cp tree minus v for verb oh let me just make mode minus pa make me sure that there's no it doesn't pause the screen for every so many lines 
FTP tree from uh, minus V for verbose uh, and we're going to say from the root file system onto DA and I th how do you know what I think this should be CP tree minus Z is a, an error, a flag that doesn't exist let's see what, it, what the options are Yes, so F is force, T is times, V is a bow. So CP3 minus, we don't need the F because uh, TV, from slash to slash DA. Okay, let's go. So we're copying every file from the floppy's root file system into including into into slash da now the nice thing about this is that it won't get into a, a recursive loop because if you can imagine once it gets to slash da there'll be something in slash da uh, it doesn't it doesn't have that problem so here we are we're copying the uh, the root chromix.sys which is the operating system itself we're now starting with the bin the binary directory and you can see it's copying those files. Now I've created this floppy disk with a smattering of programs that are needed to start the computer. Now uh, Chromix 168 was one of the last versions of Chromix to be produced and the full operating system takes a couple of megabytes in terms of files and code and place to generate the operating system. So you could reckon on at least two or three megabytes and there was two or three floppies worth to actually um, fully have all the operating system and that's without any application so really in the late 80s or the mid 80s when these systems were in their heyday you really did need a hard drive to um, to make best use of the system you couldn't fit all the programs you needed from the bin directory for example onto a single floppy um, and even if your system had the maximum, which was four floppy disk drives, that really wasn't enough. Um, okay, so we're finishing off the bin directory. It's actually copying the files as they were placed onto the drive. Because you can see it's not in alphabetical order. I think it's using the time, and this is the kind of this is the kind of this is the sequence I must have copied the files onto that floppy drive. Just to show you, that's not in alphabetical order. So CDOS and TTY, for example, it's more or less alphabetical. But So here's the dev directory. So each each physical device, just like on Unix or Linux, because this is a, a Unix-like system, is uh, each physical device has a, an entry in the dev directory. Now, Karenko did tend to at the, in the latter days they batched them up into into directories, and I include some of those full directories here because even though that we don't have those devices, it's nice to see what major and minor device numbers were around for what products. This is the ESDI drives here. These are for printers, and you'll see that's for a quad art serial printer. Then we've got different terminals. You can see you can have a lot of different terminals. You can have up to nine terminals defined there. These are octart terminals, OTTYs, MTTYs, a similar way your satellite terminals. You can have tape drives. And the CPU card can have a 68,000 and a Z80. So you talk to the Z80 via the dev directory. Yeah. Okay, we're nearly done. I don't think I have to waffle for much longer.
This is the ETC directory where uh, some of the firmware is kept, the login program is kept, the, the startup shell, yeah, shell.bin is kept there. Uh, we've got things like cron for job uh, time jobs. And these .iops are loadable firmware modules that go are sent to the the satellite computer systems. In other words, this this you've got a main CPU and memory, and then to handle the I/O, you'd have S100 cards with their own Z80 and, and memory in there, and those programs, those cards, ha would have the ability to have their code loaded at runtime. So there's a ROM on that on those satellite boards as a default, but you can override that ROM by having a program to IOP and sending that program on boot. And that's what the IO startup command does. Here. In the gen directory you'll see we have uh, not much, we just have we would have if we had space, we'd have files to generate a new Chrome operating system. So we've written now all the files from the floppy onto the onto the mountable root file system of the hard drive. The last thing we need to do is to write the boot block. So wboot std0. Oh, is that going to work on its own? I think it will. Can it find the right file? It's clever. Yeah, it does. So wboot takes an optional parameter, which is the name of the of the boot. Uh, uh, the boot bot file and puts it onto the, the hard drive but it's done that automatically it's found it from the etc directory and that's minus l slash etc slash std something it's it's written that file this file has been written onto the header of this partition. Okay, so everything should be good here. I'm paranoid, so I just type sync, sync, sync. And now I'm going to do a controlled shutdown. And now we're going to do a retest of the hard drive once we've rebooted the system in the monitor. Then we're going to boot from the hard drive and then everything is fine and the drive is ready for sale. Right, so we're going to shut down. I'm going to press the reset button on the Kuwaito system. Uh, now the uh, 64 FDC is waiting. I've got a serial connection on that port. It's waiting for me to hit enter to automatically determine the bode rate. So I'm going to hit enter. So now we're in the monitor program. We're in the RDOS monitor program. We're going to test the system. So the, the operating system is not We're running from ROM. Test the memory. It's a hard drive. It's unit zero. I'm going to hit enter. It's done a seek test and everything is fine. Um, so it looks to me like it's got to 333 hex. So let me just do a little conversion. Uh, saying Google Browser, not you don't see that. Convert 333 x to des decimal. Oh, come on, where are we? Binary octal 819. Brilliant, that's correct because it's from 0 to 819. So, at the lowest level, the monitor system, oops, the monitor has done a, a seek to the end track, and then down, and has done a restore, and everything's fine. Okay, so we've come out of there. Now we're going to do a, a B of ST zero. Let's see if it works. Wow. 
Right, as soon as you see that prompt, you know that it's read the operating system. Fantastic. Remember it was 6 for SEDC and the minor device was 0. Look at that speed. None of that floppy nonsense. Hard drive all the way. Fantastic. So uh, if I do a mode minus PA, so I can say something like find on the root device and print out all the files. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Can I say minus type directory? Minus print. So that's saying find from the root directory all of, of things of type directory and print them out. I could say find from the root directory and just print. I'll print out all the files. These are all the files that we copied from the floppy, if you remember. So everything is working absolutely fine. The drive is working like, the, like fantastic. Very pleased. Okay, so it's, it's going to be a, f a sad farewell. This is disk D24. It's a Seagate ST251-1. Uh, if I do a disk info, again, of STD31, you'll see that we have got um, a system with 820 cylinders, six surfaces. With the Kromenko formatting, uh, we've got between 1 and 814, we've got 40, roughly 48 megabytes of space. Uh, from 815 to the end of the disk is the alt, uh, alternate track table here, which is currently empty because the disk is, uh, is at the moment running totally error free. And track 0 is not used for data, it's used for other things like the partition table, like the disk label, uh, which is where this disk parameter is stored. Okay, I think that is absolutely everything. This drive does actually. Um, can I prove this? This drive does actually automatically, when the power is turned off, it it retracts the heads to a shipping zone place. Um, I'm trying to just prove that by. Right, here's the information manual for the drive and look at some of the features here. So it says the ST251 etc etc automatically park the read write heads in the shipping zone at power down. So I don't have to do anything special in this case to put the heads into a safe place when it's powered down. So I'm just going to power it down gracefully in the standard way. Kill minus two one. Uh, I think if you've managed to get to, to the end of this video with just uh, your sanity intact, I think you, you deserve some sort of award. And now you know how to uh, check an MFM hard drive using a Kromenko system and fully populate the operating system and write the boot block and boot from it. So how about that? Okay, thanks for watching.